Good morning. Uh, welcome to Risen City Church. I'm so glad uh, to be here with you today. My name is, is Mike, and I am one of the leaders here at the church. And if this is your first time with us today at Risen City, maybe it's your first time with us specifically at, at this church, or maybe it's your first time in church in a long time. Maybe it's your first time in church ever. I just want to say a special welcome to you today, because no matter where you are on, also on the journey or the spectrum of faith, whether you're here today and you're seeking for something, searching for more, maybe you're here, you've been saved your whole life, and you're just doing this thing called church and loving Jesus, or maybe you're here and you don't really know why. You're actually a little more skeptical. You don't really uh, want to be here. Maybe you're invited and you just happen to show up. I just want to say that to you that thank you for being here because really that you're part of the reason why we do this, that we want to help real people like you meet the real Jesus because we don't believe that God is just some idea that we ascribe to, just some sort of spiritual thing that is out there, but a person to be known and encountered and experienced as a church. It's, it's our goal. It's our hope that we would be a church that leads people like you into a soul-changing relationship with Jesus, that, that in moments like this where, where we believe God enters a space that we can truly know him, that we don't want to be about creating, you know, just another religious ceremonial experience for people, but truly a moment of encountering Jesus, of, of him entering the space, of heaven and earth colliding, of, of him doing something in our souls that's real and tangible and, and changes us. And so we're excited to be doing that today. And to catch everybody up, we are actually coming to the end of a series that we've been doing over the last uh, months of summer called Apprentice. And it's a simple series based on the simple idea that as Christians, what we believe is that, is that the life that Jesus calls us to is, is the best life, in fact. That we should be people who not only rely on him for what we call salvation, but also to learn life from him. That we are called to be apprentices of life in him. That we're supposed to learn some things on how he did life and how he goes about life. And, and that, that at the end of that, he offers us, as we read at the beginning of this series in John, fullness of joy the greatest of life, that if we uh, abide in him and walk with him and, and trust in him and, and give him our life and become apprentices of him, we actually get a kind of joy that you can't find anywhere else, the greatest joy that the human soul could ever experience. And so we're going to continue uh, that today as we sort of bring it to a conclusion. So if you have a Bible, uh, if you want to open up to the book of Matthew, we're going to be in the book of Matthew today, chapter 28. If you don't have a Bible, that's all right. We're what we will have on the screen behind me in just a moment. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, Matthew was found in the part of the Bible that we Christians call the New Testament. It's a part of the Bible that's explicitly about the life of Jesus, how he lived, what he said, what he did, how he died for sin and rose from the dead, and how we live in light of that. Now, we do believe the whole Bible, every page, is about Jesus, is interpreted through Jesus. He clarifies it all, but the New Testament explicitly gives his earthly life and what he did, and Matthew is one of the Gospels, or sort of the, the bio, biographical accounts of his life, how he taught and preached, how he called disciples to himself, how he, as I said, died and rose again. And in Matthew 28, we sort of come to Matthew's sort of end of the story. And some of the final words of Jesus, and, and this is what we read, starting in verse 16. Now, the 11 disciples um, went to Galilee. Now, if, if you notice, there's 11 because Judas is no longer part of it because of the whole betrayal thing, not really like the greatest moment in his life. Um, and they go to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus has directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. They recognized that Jesus isn't just some guru, just some man, just some spiritual guy, but he is to be worshipped as, as God. They recognize the divinity of Jesus and they worship. But then it says this, but some doubted. And I just want to say this quickly today, that, that even amongst them seeing the risen Jesus, there is still this kind of doubt in their heart. It's okay to have some questions in the journey of faith. That, the, that you can belong to the people of God and yet still have some things to get worked out. So if you're someone here today and you're thinking that, like, I don't know all the answers to everything, that's okay. You're allowed to be part of the community of faith because even amongst the disciples who could see him, they still doubt a little bit. And so just be okay. Let, let the grace of God just well warm over us a little bit, even when we have some, so some doubts to still work out, all right? And he says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority or power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples or, or apprentices of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray again. Jesus, we do thank you uh, for your word today. I thank you for this opportunity to stand on the stage and, and share, God, your word to this church. And, and I just want to take a moment, God, and just again, a pause and, 
and just submit this moment to you, God. This is uh, your word. This is your sermon, God. I, I thank you for the gifts you've given to me to, to be in this space, but I just want to give them back to you and allow you to just pour down into our church anything that you want. We want to be a church that receives from you only, God, what you want for us. And so we just say, God, there's anything in, in me right now that is not of you. God, any words I thought were, were clever or, 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 or were good for us but actually aren't from your heart, that you would silence them in my mind, that they would not pass my, my lips. God, that we would today simply only hear your heart for this church. I thank you for that, God. And we pray that, that, that you will just move in the next few moments, God, through your word. We thank you. We praise you. We lift you up. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, it's no secret if you're part of our church that, that, that I, uh, more than other sports, appreciate the game, the beautiful game um, of basketball, right? And I understand that not everybody in the room likes it the same amount that I do or, you know, or, or can appreciate it to the same extent that I do. And, and again, that is okay. We, we, we do have prayer ministry after. We would love to pray for that brokenness evidence in your life because if you're going to love Jesus, you got to love basketball. That's part of the Bible. It's in there, Mike chapter 1. And here's the thing, right? The reason that's not true, just in case you don't know. Um, I was just a joke. Um, there's no book of Mike. That would be pretty, anyways, never mind. Um, it, it, the reason why I, I love a game like that is because there's actually something beautiful in in the game of basketball that I will admit, I will admit, you can find in a few other sports. Uh, maybe hockey, I'll give that one. It could potentially work in this example. But actually, it's interesting. I found it also to be true of dance. When my, my young girl, she, she's three and loves to dance, and when she watches ballets on YouTube or something like that, you, I can actually see this dynamic happening there. It's just this cool dynamic of, of a bunch of different people, right, each with different levels of skill and ability and roles in, in the moment, all moving together to ultimately achieve the single common end. End, right in the game of basketball, it's to win. It's from the championship to, to make the game. And the best teams always, um, ones that almost seem poetic in, in, in nature and how they move and the rhythm and the, and the cadence of the game are, are guys who understand that they're not all the same, but yet they all move in the same common direction. There's this sort of thing that happens and, and, and where, where all these individual people can sort of put aside themselves for the sake of the common goal, for the common joy of, of, in this case, in basketball, be winning. In the church, it's not necessarily winning, but there is something similar here that although we've talked about for the last few weeks, this idea of individual calling, of individual purpose in the kingdom of God and discovering that, on top of that, there is another layer of joy that we need to begin to see, that there's a joy that comes in the community of faith pursuing the common mission of God, that if we want to get to almost a deeper layer of communal understanding, of communal relations, and also collective joy, we got to see that together we are called actually to the same end. That no matter who you are, we have a common calling to pursue together. And so, you know, over the last nine weeks, we have been tracking through this series over the summer. It's hard to believe. Can we be real? That the summer is over, right? It's, it's like August 26th today. September 1st is this week, which is just ridiculous. But, but we've gone over this series, and, and I would say that we've tried to set up some pretty foundational things for our church, that we want to be known by some of the stuff that we have seriously talked about, that as individuals and as a collective body together, right, we want to be a church that, that allows the apprentice heart to fully flourish. That we want to be a church of the best apprentices we can truly be, that, that we are people that in our life are creating space for genuine encounter with Jesus through what we call the disciplines, that we sort of set ourselves up in places in worship like this and our private prayer and study and prayer meetings together, that, that we would just meet Jesus, have him begin to change us and shape us and form us around the character of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control active in our life. And that from that place we would go and find our spot in the kingdom of heaven, the, the calling that we might have, the place of redemption that God wants to work in us, that, that we recognize that God actually wants you today to be involved in his work of redemption. You have a unique contribution to that space. But, but as I said, um, it doesn't really matter who you are or what gifts you may or may not have, or, or what place you might think that you find yourself in, if you are someone who, who claims to be an apprentice of Jesus, then all of us together have a singular common call that if we can move together on, like I said, I believe there will be a greater kind of joy for us. See, and, and what we read today in the book of Matthew, it is pretty, it, it's, a, it's a pretty like foundational verse. Like, if you're someone who grew up in church, you've probably heard this verse 
many a times over. Now, if you're someone who maybe is newer to faith or, or you're, not, you're not even a Christian, you don't know much about the Bible, then, then it's a, as obscure as any other passage I could have opened up to. But, but for Christians, it's, it's, pr- it's pretty bedrock. It's one of those verses that sort of found us and ground us in, in, in many ways. And just to catch everybody up, in, in the light of the story, Jesus, he has been living on earth for about 33 years, 30 of those years in sort of relative obscurity, working as potentially a, a carpenter. Some may have even argued for a stonemason, depending on your geographical understanding of where he lived, and it doesn't really matter, but he's working out there. And then for the last three years of his life, he does what, it, what we call his ministry. He, he gets baptized by John, goes in the desert, wrestles with the devil, wins the temptation, starts preaching and teaching on, uh, on the kingdom of God, inviting people to understand that God is moving right now. That he does some pretty crazy miracles, walks on water, raises the dead, multiplies bread, calls a bunch of disciples to follow him. And all these things in and of themselves are pretty spectacular, but then the great greatest thing happens, right, what what we as Christians call um, salvation, because he goes and dies on a cross at the hands of unjust rulers. He was rejected and murdered, abandoned by his closest friends, hung between heaven and earth. That's the great sacrifice for your and my sin, to make a way possible for you and I to come and know God again, to have our guilt taken, our shame gone, because it all gets put on him, and he gives us his righteousness, the great exchange of, of my worst for his best happens. And then after that, three days later, he's been laid in the grave, walks up out of a tomb, right? Because sin caused death, but it was sin was defeated on the cross, so was death. And so for us who trust in him now, death is no longer a fear of ours. It's no longer an enemy of ours. It has been defeated in him. And all this stuff is pretty, pretty spectacular. And then we come to Matthew. Because we see that Jesus has, has done his work. He's accomplished the mission for which he was sent. And he calls his disciples together after about 40 days of, of being resurrected and meeting with them in different ways and, and cooking some fish and making some bread and having breakfast and hanging out and teaching them. And he brings them all to this point. And, and what we begin to see here in our scriptures is actually sort of like some of the last words of Jesus to his people. He's got his guys together and he says, this is sort of the last thing I need you to go and do. This is the the last command. We call as Christians the great commission, the great task to go and accomplish. And it's interesting because, as I said, most Christians know about this verse. Most, in fact, in this room probably could quote it almost verbatim, but yet would say at the same time, it's one of the hardest things to actually go and live out. And and, and I want to pause it to us today that if we consider all that we've said over the last nine weeks as a church, if we sort of put it all together, we will begin to see that this is not as daunting as we often make it out to be. And the fear that we have of of pursuing this actually can be reduced as we begin to understand that there is a collective call that he speaks to us as, as individuals, but also as part of a unit, of a body, of a church, that this is what we are to be about together. See, if, if you're here today, and maybe you, you, you aren't a Christian and, and, and you've always sort of wondered, you know, why do Christians, whenever like I'm at work or in my neighborhood or whatever, why do they always want to tell me about their personal faith in Jesus? Why do they always want to let me know about their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as all the memes like to make us seem like to be? Or, or why we have like the bumper stickers, right? The lame ones, you know, like my captain's a carpenter, dumb stuff like that. Or, or the t-shirts, right, that say something about Jesus. Or, or the obnoxious office mugs that are like this big with big like red letters that God loves you and put on the corner of the desk. Or, or the Facebook post that say if you if you share it you love Jesus if you like it you appreciate him if you don't you're going to hell like that that's just dumb stuff that we put out but we ever wonder why why it's actually because of these verses right here the heart of it is right here not the lame Christian stuff that's the whole other problem we got Christian capitalism happening and lame people thinking creative ideas if you put Jesus on at work or people who actually honestly think that maybe a mug speaks louder than the volumes of their character but that's for a whole other day to talk about um, but the heart of what we're getting at actually becomes here because Jesus looks at his apprentices his disciples and says guys go and invite other people to be apprentices with you Go and invite other people to understand the hope that you have found, the joy that you have discovered, the the, the forgiveness that you claim to know. Go and invite other people into the story that you have found to be the greatest one ever told. Go and and let people know about it. Because here's the thing, here's the thing. If what we have been saying for the past nine weeks is actually true, 
If this is the best life that, that we believe you can have, that there's the greatest joy that we find in following Jesus, that, that forgiveness is actually possible, that religion is, is over, that grace has won, that love is as amazing as we say that it is, if there is hope for every single day because a tomb has been emptied, because God made the way, if this is actually real, why in the world would we not want people to know that? And you could even argue potentially that it's actually quite evil of us to not invite others into it. Even those people that we don't really like all that much because why would we not them? Why would we not want them to cultivate in their soul the health of knowing Jesus, the calling that he asked them to connect them with the purpose of his life and the character that might come into their heart? Why would we not want that? In fact, Jesus says, here's part of the, the work for us to, to do that. We call as Christians often evangelism, discipleship. And here's the thing. I want to make sure we all get this. This is not some radical religious idea, right? We do this all the time. We just don't always call it discipleship or evangelism. It happens to you all the time, in fact. Right? Every, every single moment of our day, we are being told stories, um, preached narratives, given messages, invited to a kind of way of life. Every worldview, philosophy, culture at large, from the greatest institutions to the everyday conversations are constantly trying to tell us, here's how you should view life. Here's how you should think about this. Here's what you should know about this. Uh, media, entertainment, school, business, each other. We're constantly in the conversation of trying to lay out our ideas and convince people that ours is probably the best one, even as funny, the idea, the idea that, that you should not share your faith publicly is itself an idea that's trying to get you to believe it. So it's trying to convert you to its side to keep you silent in your sharing. Sort of ironic, a little bit. Or how about this? Are you a person who has relationships with people? The answer is probably yes, right? Have you ever been in maybe a slight disagreement? Right? You have a certain thing that you both see different sides on. and Maybe spouses. Can we be real? Right? You do this a lot. Right? You have a moment, and, and you and your spouse have to make a decision, have to do something, and you end up not really agreeing on the, on the ways of going in. So because you are obviously a very smart person, you come to your wife prepared with a list of 17 reasons why clearly you're right, and you go and present these things to her. And then she says 17 other things you never considered and implications that you never thought of, and you begin realizing that you should just listen to her in the first place. Thank God for a gracious wife. Right? This happens all the time. The question is this. The question is not whether you're preaching a message or not. The question is not whether you're trying to share something and invite people to respect it or not. The question is what is what you're sharing, is what you're giving, is what you evangelize for worth sharing? Is the story that you tell worth telling? Is, is what you're actually saying life is meant to work and see and the worldview that you present actually worth inviting others into? That's really the question. Is what you present in your life worth someone else saying, hey, maybe I want that too? Because as Christians, what we begin to see is that we actually believe above all other things in the marketplace of all ideas, philosophies, religions, worldviews, perspectives on how and what the world should be, the ultimate meanings of life, we believe the best one, the truest one, the coherentest one, the, the greatest one actually is following Jesus. And what we begin to see in him today is he looks at, at you and I and says, guys, there are people who need this story. There are people who need to know that hope is still alive, that grace is still good, that love does still do something for your heart, that joy is possible, and my chosen method of sharing the message is you. Is you. Which should sort of confound us. Can we be real? It should sort of uh, confuse us, humble us, scare us, and also sort of empower us. Why? Because cause, cause here's my thought. Why would Jesus, why would Jesus uh, use the very people that he had to come and die for because we had messed it up so bad? And trust, why would he entrust them with the message that he's inevitably knowing that they're going to screw it up? act hypocritical, not figure it all out, to be the ones to share it. Like, why would he do that? And it's really beautiful because actually it's the message itself, right? It's, it's the grace of God that we believe that we've been given a place we could not earn, been given a love we could not deserve. We've been welcomed into a family that we could not work for, that we have been given a grace that when I was a sinner, I was saved, when I was broken, he has healed me, when I was wounded, he met in me, that I haven't figured it all out. I still am a hypocrite at times, but yet I can point you to the place where my hypocrisy gets healed, where my wounds get mended, and where my sins got forgiven. Like, I haven't figured it all out 
out yet, but I can point to the place where I can begin that discovery. See, what we begin to see is that Jesus actually enlists the very people that make the message of his grace most prominent because there's messes in their life that he's been fixing. And this should, so this should sort of work us up a little bit because, like, why, well, why in the world would God want to use someone like, like, because at the end of the day, if he's God, if he's God, right, then that means at his disposal, he's got angels, right? We've, we've seen it happen in the Bible. He'll go and translate a message to people through the angels. So if he wanted, right, a perfect sort of verbatim translation from his heart to people, he could have just sent angels to everyone, right? But yet he doesn't. Yet he waits and says, hey, guys. I actually would like you to be involved in this. I, 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 I would like you to have a, have a role to play in, in my redemption. Oh, the very sin that you got freed of, someone else needs to know that it's possible. Oh, you know, the things that you struggle with, actually someone else needs to know that there's freedom from that. Oh, oh maybe what which you got broken out of, someone else needs to know the keys to get out of that jail cell too. And maybe your life is meant to be a billboard for the grace of God, that the mess that you think you got actually makes truer the message that our God is still working and good. See, this should completely, completely make us feel the weight of this, that God, you would do this in my life. It should increase our fear. That God, may I live a life worthy of this message, but it also should empower us that he's actually wanting to use your life in this way. That, that you have this role to play. See, in John chapter 15, when we talked about it a few weeks ago, we said that, that God wants to produce the fruit in us, the fruit of our character, the fruit of our calling. And, uh, and we've been looking at the calling in a very specific way, but really the, the message of this is that there's the calling or the, the fruits of ministry, the fruits of the gospel going out, that God actually wants to use your life your life, to bring the life of heaven into other people's life. That, that hear me, you could say it like this, that one of the final working out of, or, or one of the final effects of apprenticeship in your life will always be mission, will always be inviting others to the life that you have found, that you have not fully matured in your apprenticeship until you are willing to say, people, follow me as I follow this guy, because I don't know exactly all the answers, but I know where they begin. So Jesus looks at us. He says, you have a message and you, you need to share. But it's interesting because if you pick up the Bible and we read it, he says this to the group. See, we often read this as an individual thing, that this is to me, but it, and it is, sure, surely, but he actually says it in the context of, of the community, right? This is if we were from the South, right? We'd say, y'all, Right? This is where my accent lends itself well, right? Oh, we need some fried chicken and some waffles, and we'd be set. And he says to y'all, everybody, right, that all authority has been given to me, so go, therefore, and make disciples. Make apprentices. Invite people to this life that you have found. He says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son. And now, if you don't know what, what baptism is, just quickly, it, it is the symbol, it's this outward symbol of this inward confession that we have chosen to follow Jesus. It's where people, maybe you've seen it before, right? People get, get dunked in a bunch of water, right? Like, like, like how you eat Oreos. It's like spiritual Oreos, you know what I'm saying? Because we all know the best way to eat an Oreo is how? Fully submerged in a glass of milk, right? Or, you know, almond juice or whatever you drink because... We're in that day and age. But you pick it out, right? It's not like halfway, it's full way. You dump it all the way in. Same is true of us as human beings. We need to get dunked in the water as a symbol of our death to self. We come up as a symbol of life in Jesus. It's, it's making public what has been made private in me. See, it's given the context of a community that this is done to the public eye that I am a follower of Jesus. And so here's the, here's the thing. If you're here today, and maybe over the course of the series, maybe over the course of your life, you've come to choose to be a disciple of Jesus, but yet have not been baptized in obedience to Jesus, then I want to encourage you to actually do that today. That this is a step of faith that we've made to say, God, I'm taking my faith to this public place of I'm declaring that I am your apprentice in front of everybody in front of all my community, in front of the whole world that I am yours. And so if you're someone who, who's like that, maybe you haven't made that, that, that jump yet, if you, I know it's an easy first step, but if you fill out a connect card and just type, take off baptism, we will set that up for you. Obviously it won't be in this room because the Apollo does not like water being around their equipment, understandably so, right? But we'll make it happen. We, we had a baptism back at the beginning of the summer, and it was awesome, and we would love to have them every single week if we can. That would be great. Um, so if that's you, right, let, let us know. We would love to baptize you. And then he goes on to say, in the name of the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this isn't key, because what we begin to realize here is that in the work of the church, we have to recognize the reality of the triune God, that's all persons of the Trinity, that our God, and, and this is something that we need to think about deeply, that our God is unique in this sense, right, that he's a triune in nature, that, that, that when people say, you know, God is just whatever you make him out to be, or all the gods are the same, that's just not true, that Jesus even says right here that God is Father, Son, and Spirit, that if you speak to a God and pray to a God and, and sing to a God that is not triune in nature, you're not speaking to the God of the Bible. They're not, they're not, not all gods are equal, and we would say that Jesus here very clearly states that our God, that, that he is second person of this triune, monotheistic deity known as Yahweh, Jesus, Father, Son, Spirit. This is who he is, but he's active and present in the work of the church. And he says, now when you baptize and you invite them, what does he say next? Teach them to do what? To observe all that I have commanded, which is interesting because what have we said apprenticeship is? Following the commands of Jesus, walking in submission to him. That Back in John 15, he said, if you will abide in my word, if you live from my word, you will find joy. So what does he say? Guys, teach people the pathway to joy, which is the apprenticeship of Jesus. He Teach them what you have found. Teach them how to, how to find what their heart is actually looking for, to obey the things that I have said. And then he says something incredible, and behold. I am with you always to the end of the age. What does he say? He promises us in this moment that his presence is always with us when we are on the mission of Jesus. That, that he promises us his presence as we, the church, pursue the very heart of God. That, that he is still, hear me, the active agent in getting the word out. That by his spirit, he empowers his people and his presence to do the very things he's called them to do. Which means this for us, that, that Jesus is staring before us today. And if I could sum it up, he's saying, guys, I, Jesus, I still got more work to do. But I want to do it through you. I still got some people to, to tap on the shoulder and let them know the grace is good. But I want to, I want to use you to do that. Because there are people who still need to know this moment that hope is real. But I want them to hear that from your lips. That, that there's people who need to know that forgiveness is still as good today as it's ever been. That there's no sin too great that I can't forgive. There's no past too, too, too ominous that I can't redeem. There's nothing too deep, too dark, too, too dirty that I can't make whole and clean and nice and new and good. There's no truth that I, that there's no lie that I can't speak truth into. There's no one too captive that I can't free. But I want them to hear that through your life. I want to use you in this. That you're part of this plan. And so uh, uh, at some level, this should, should hopefully stir us as individuals, but this is where we need to begin to consider as a community the calling in this. That this is not just to us as individual people, but to us, the people of God. That as a church, this is our calling. And this is why we really need to begin to see over the last sort of nine weeks how this all begins to fit together. Because this has all been leading ultimately to, 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 to this moment. That this has been purposeful. That if you call Risen City Church your home, I would actually encourage you to go back and and listen to every single sermon to see what God has been building and moving us forward. Because it's really coming to this place where we believe that we want to be this kind of church. A church that's in full submission to the mission of God, to the will of the Father, and our assignment in this moment. As we live out in the everyday common faithfulness of our disciplines as a community. To be in places of genuine encounter with God in our prayer, and our study, and our connect groups, and our worship times, and, and our prayer meetings, and all these different things that, that begin to put us in very places where God can meet us and transform us and grow in us what? The character of Christ. That, that we would be a church that then goes and gets defined by the love that permeates us, the joy that exudes from us, the peace that surrounds us, the kindness and patience and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control that shapes every part of who we are, not just as individuals but as a collective body that we become the witness to the very character of Jesus that, that, that upholds us as we go and then do church in the, in the gifts of the Spirit, which we said are the only ongoing place of power from heaven to be effective in his ministry, that we would see the love gifts happening that display practically the love of God, the word gifts teaching and clarifying the heart of God, the power gifts showing the reality of God in all spaces, in the course of our faithfulness, in the moments of encounter, we see the reality of Jesus being shown. And why is this so important? Because hear me, when you look at the life of Jesus, this is exactly how he lived. Right? Because he was sustained. He was sustained in the disciplines. 
study and prayer and fasting and, and serving. He, he did these things himself, but then how did he move in his ministry? He moved in the word gifts. Teaching, clarifying, calling, rebuking, seeking the kingdom of God, showing people in, in word that this is the reality of heaven. He moved in love gifts, compassion and mercy, caring for those who were out and marginalized, moving and, and living and being with those that religion had cast aside, showing the very heart of God in his life and in his mission, which is the basis of our gospel, the love of God to see. And then he moved in power in healing and miracles discernment and knowledge he he showed very powerfully that the kingdom of God is bursting forth into the world that there is a healing that is happening that that now we as post-resurrection Christians see the resurrection hope and power available in every single moment if you look at the life of Jesus how did people come to know him in one of these three ways they began to encounter him and understand him and know him in, in each of these veins and his love and compassion for some and his clarifying word and calling and others and the power of freedom, uh, of healing and casting out demons and other people. And here's the thing. Here's the crazy thing. The same is true today. This is still how people encounter Jesus. And we live in this weird culture today that, 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 that sort of is confused, I'd say at best. At one level, right, we have we're, we're post-truth and post-fact and post-Christendom, but yet we want answers for everything, right? We, we, we want to be defined by love, but don't really know how to give it out equally or, 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 or to actually know how to, to live it out in the everyday minutia of justice. We, we want to live for something greater than ourselves, but don't really know what that is. And so every single week, there's a new thing to get on board of. And, and we want to have deep spiritual encounters, and we're hungry for something spiritual, yet we want to reject the ancient traditions and the institutions of, of the church because we don't really trust them because of whatever reasons of hypocrisy. We want to be deep in our, in our minds and our love, but yet we seem to be confused on who we are and we don't really know where to go. And yet it's funny because I think this is powerful that God equips the church to answer every single deep hunger of culture. Did you see this? Because here's the thing. Right, for those who, who are waiting to be loved and to know that God actually cares and, and is looking for something greater than themselves, we have the love gifts fully active that show the mercy, the tangible love, compassion, and justice of God active in the community of faith. For those who need to wrestle and understand, we have the word gifts creating rational intellectual space for those to debate and understand and wrestle with the biggest questions of life and clarifying truly the truth that God is who he is, that the gospel is real, that he has spoken, and we can argue that mentally then we have the power gifts displaying for those who are spiritually hungry for a real thing that God is not some ambiguous spiritual ether thing in the air but a present and powerful person willing to save, set free and deliver in this moment we have the character of the church displaying the heart of God as every single aspect love, word and power display in a moment the reality and the presence that God is here I don't know about you but I think, I think this is the church that Jesus wants to create. See if, see, if you can track with me for a second, what's the picture that we are painting here? We, we are seeing a community where, where, you know, the Mother Teresas of the world and, 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 the, and, and the Ravi Zacharias or the William Lane Craig's, the philosophers of the world and the charismatics and, and, and those power people all are together and, and the beautiful parts of every single one are being fully manifested so that no matter who you are and whatever hunger you might have from whatever space you might come, whatever culture or background you might be in, you have a moment to encounter the risen God in love, word, power and character and discipline and faith that no matter who you are, Transcend time, culture, moments, programs, philosophies, understandings of church ministry. All those things are awesome and good, but really what is it? It's this palpable presence of God. Because it's funny, if you think about it, almost about 80% of the world today that's non-Western actually meets God, not through the way that we typically do it, just by saying a bunch of true things about him, but by actually experiencing, encountering, and and feeling and, and seeing the God at work. And, and, and I think, I think that if we were to be a church of apprentices that seek to follow him in all things, then we would mimic our life after the pattern of Jesus. This is actually what he's pursuing in us. 
that we would be a church where this actually begins to happen. As we choose to cultivate this community, to cultivate this family called church, we would cultivate the genuine places of encounter in this moment where we people can seriously feel and know that God is in this place. As we sort of cultivate the character of Jesus to uphold us and to shape us and, and to be the witness for us, that we would cultivate the calling of heaven, that we would find those places and enlist people in the power that they have been given from heaven to be affected, that we would begin to see God move. And this, by the way, is the church that we want to become. Can we admit it today? This is not the church we have been. The reason why we spent nine weeks going over this over the summer is as we move into the next phase of our church, this is what we want to move into. A place where this is the reality in all things, that we are sort of hitting reset on, on Risen City and saying, no, what we've been doing is awesome. It's got us to where we need to be. But from now on, this is actually who we are, this place of, of, of doing this. God, would you send all these things to make them real here? As scary as that might be, as, as unheard of as it might sound, that this is actually what we want. And hear me today, what this means for you individually is actually quite powerful. Because I think if you can connect to what I'm saying today, then what you begin to hear is this, that the pressure Christians often put on themselves that cripple them in the fear of not going out and doing the Great Commission get alleviated knowing that actually the calling for you to do that is part of the communal calling of everyone, that we all have a role to play in this mission going out. That maybe, that maybe, Maybe it's not about a single programmatic method of you sharing your faith in some way with the five points of salvation to get them to the place of decision on every single moment. Or, but, 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 but maybe you can't answer every philosophical question that gets posed to you. But somehow you find yourself often in conversations where people feel that they can just trust you and they can open up to you, that, that they feel heard and cared for by you and, and you just always are just in these spaces where people are saying that to you and so you take the opportunity to say well here's what Jesus has done or maybe you're someone who finds yourself always in these rigorous intellectual debates about philosophy and the greatest questions of life and you just always are there in the space trying to speak to the, the clarifications of, of intellectual rigor and, and you find yourself in that space or maybe you're someone who always just feels compelled to actually pray for that person at work just always is coming up or maybe God's even used your life to speak specifically to someone else else is, then, then maybe, hear me today, then maybe that's actually how God wants to use you in the mission of, of the church. Maybe it's, it's more about recognizing how God has ordained you, gifted you, called you, and chose you for such a time as this and that place and that time to make the most of that opportunity and not to try to force yourself into some other vein of evangelism, but being who God's actually made you to be and using, using how he's wired you as we said in the church, but also now in the mission of the church. That maybe it's less, maybe it's less about fitting a mold and more about being bold in every moment we've been given and the gifts we have to speak well of the grace of Jesus. Because here's the thing, it doesn't matter what gifts you may or may not have. It doesn't excuse our need as Christians generally to love well and serve well, to be generous and hospitable. It, it doesn't mean that we, have, we can't speak boldly the truth. Because hear me today, love without the word given is actually uh, directionless. And, and the word given without love, though, right, is, is usually unheard and cold. But power done without both of them is dangerous and ambiguous. So we need all these things together. That all of us actually have a role to play in the Great Commission going out. That if we don't have each other, we aren't as healthy. We aren't as effective. We will not be as good. And when you say to someone, hey, I'm going to be able to answer that question, but I know Joe over there, he's really good at that. Let's go talk to him. Now what do we have? We have a team that works for a common goal, knowing their role and finding deeper joy in it. But you have been called to this. If you are an apprentice of Jesus, right, that final working out of that is that you invite others to be one as well. That mission always comes at the end of our maturity. You know what, as a church, this is so important. This is so important. Why? Because I actually truly think, as I mentioned, that this is the church that God wants to create. How, how do I know that? Well, there's a very famous passage in the book of Acts, chapter 2, that describes the earliest church when Jesus first started it. And I want to read it for us. And I want to just see how this actually works out. 
Because if just a quick reading, what, what, what you begin to see is exactly what we've been talking about. And that maybe Jesus wants to get us back to this place of knowing that in this moment, there is still the possibility of what we found here today. And it says in verse 42, And they, being the, the, the community, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship or gathering together, to the breaking of bread or communion, to the prayers. That In verse 42, here's what we see, the word gifts going out clarifying the truth of the kingdom of God, teaching what is of Jesus, showing what is the pattern of faith, leading in a, in a community and into the heart of God. We see the word gifts fully active. Verse 43, and awe and wonder came upon every single soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Well, what do we see? We see power gifts happening. The presence of God being palpable in a moment of healing and being people getting set free of spiritual bondage. Verse 44 and 45, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing them to all the, in all the proceeds as any had need. What do we see the love gifts? Generosity and charity, mercy and compassion being part of this community. And then, and then in verse 46, it says this, and day by day, in ritualistic pattern, and, and, and going over the discipline of their faith, attending the temple, going to worship together, breaking of bread and doing communion, eating in their homes together. They received their food with gladness and generous hearts, with, 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 with praising God and praying and saving and having favor with all the people. What we begin to see is now a common faithfulness in the practices of discipleship, meeting together, eating together, praising together, singing together, being together. And then look what happens, the final thing, verse 47, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. The mission of God gets done. That when the church functions as he has made it to be, the mission just happens. Right? That, that we begin to see in the earliest picture of the church, a church where love gifts and power gifts and word gifts are operating in the common faithfulness of discipleship of the people of God that see the mission of God. God, this is the vision God has for church, I believe. And this is the vision that we have for here at Risen City. So by the way, if this sounds a little bit outside of your comfort zone, well, then maybe make a decision. Because maybe this isn't your spot. And I don't mean that meanly. I mean that with my whole joyous, loving heart. Because this is where we want to pursue God. God, make this reality here. This is the vision of a church that cultivates the heart of God and our submission to him, saying, God, whatever you want, in every vein, in every space, in every season, and in every kind of boundary limitation, and every gift you've given us, God, make us people who just want your heart, who want to see other people know you, encounter you, because hear me today, we do believe here. We do believe that there is no greater message, that there is no greater love, that there is no greater joy, no greater truth, no greater peace, no greater mercy, no greater life than what we find in Jesus. And it is our privilege to invite other people to know it too. We want to be a church that's submitted truly to the mission of God, which means we need to be submitted to his process. And in our next season of life as Risen City, this is where we're going. I want to make sure we said this before the fall because we want to sort of set us up for that space. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about a, a big culture reset, things that we're going to say to our church that's going to define us moving forward. We're going to talk about what we want to see happen in, in the next sort of, sort of like phase of life. And, and it all comes down to this Jesus. Whatever you want, wherever you're leading, whatever you're speaking, that's what we're chasing. Here's my question for you today if you're part of our church. Um, simply put, do you know your gifts? We talked about it a couple weeks ago, but have you prayed about it and sought it and, and tried to figure that out? Do you know your calling? Do you know your purpose? Do you know your place, your natural giftings and capacities, how they work together to form a spot? Have you, have you sought the will of God for these things? Or are you someone who does the disciplines in your personal life that you seek to encounter him in, in the moments of prayer and, and fasting discipleship and, and allow him to, to grow the character of Christ in us. Because hear me today, we will never grow if we don't grow. Do you know these things? Do you hear the call of God because he's speaking to your heart? Ben, you guys can come up. We want to end here because I want to I say this today. As we conclude, if you're here today and, and, you, don't, and you don't know Jesus, or maybe you're here today and over the last sort of few weeks of, of church, you've been someone who maybe has been tracking along, but 
But maybe even today, you haven't fully made the decision to say, I'm an apprentice of Jesus. I want today to be a day of invitation for you. That you would truly be someone who says, no, maybe this is the time that I step into the space where I'm going to follow him, two feet in, jump all into this space, an all-in kind of faith. Because we do believe that on the other side of that, you will find joy like you've never known before. Peace like you cannot describe. There's a love that overwhelms us, a grace that always sustains us, but it only comes after our submission to him. He's calling and inviting. The question today is, will you come? If you're here today and, and maybe you're one of those people that, that hasn't got baptized yet, it might seem such a simple thing, but it is a huge step of our obedience and faith that we'll be people say, Jesus, we will do what you say. And you've been baptized yet. I'm going to call you today to be baptized, to take that step of faith and to let us know so we can get that thing happening. Or maybe you're here today and you walked in the room and you have no context for faith. You aren't a Christian in any way. You wouldn't consider yourself a follower of Jesus. I want you to know something today that Jesus stands here before you in his word and says, I want you to follow me today. That I have life and joy for you in a way that you've never known before. But it comes on the other side of your faith in him. That that, that gospel, that message that we talked about all throughout this whole morning, that, that he died on a cross 2,000 years ago to make a way for us to be reconciled back to the Father, that that is what he did, that we can be guilt-free and shame-free and sin-free by the forgiveness of God, not because I'm a good person, not because I'm religious and I came to church, not because I earn it or make God happy, but simply because Jesus did all the work for me. This is why Jesus is so awesome. Because every other religion, every other philosophy says if you do enough, God will approve of you. Jesus says, I did it already, so God loves you more. The question is simple. Will we trust him with everything? I'm not saying it's easy, but it's simple. Give him your past Give him your present, give him the keys to your future, and let him guide you, walk with you, and lead you to the place of greatest hope and joy and life. For us as Christians, this isn't about getting to heaven one day, but bringing heaven down right now into my heart, into the world around me. That only comes by faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I want to pray for us. Would you stand with me today before we sing?